Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about linear algebra fundamentals. Uh, these are some tools that will allow us to uh, sort of formalize the analysis of uh, linear circuits and generate a machinery by which we can uh, put in values of currents and voltages into a uh, matrix and via some matrix operations we can find the desired results. Uh, so we're going to first begin by looking at systems of linear equations or simultaneous equations uh, which we've seen in previous algebra courses and it is a prerequisite that we understand what they are and uh, how we can find the solutions. Then we're going to learn how to represent these systems or these equations in a matrix form uh, which is very important is an important building block for uh, achieving the goals that we're looking for. Uh, then we're going to learn about what determinants are in linear algebra as well as Kramer's rule um, and don't worry about uh, what it means right now if you don't know what it is uh, and after that we're going to look at matrix inversion which is another method for uh, finding um, solutions to these uh, matrix problems uh, and finally we're gonna take a quiz as usual to test our understanding so before we go any further let's recall what our main goal is here our overarching goal our goal is to look at linear circuits and find the voltages across and the currents through various loops and nodes as defined in the KCL and KVL lecture. And so far we've looked at one of the passive components that we're going to be dealing with which is resistors. But in the future, in the next few lectures, we're going to also look at capacitors and inductors. Uh, we'll look at resistors pretty in depth in the sense that we've looked at uh, the various ways you can combine them and uh, whatnot. So uh, after these uh, few lectures, we're going to get into capacitors and inductors and uh, more useful and more uh, uh, circuits that you would see more commonly in uh, more sophisticated analog design. Okay, so let's review uh, a very important building block and that is systems of linear equation. In this case, we have uh, two equations and two unknowns. The unknowns are x1 and x2, which you can see they are uh, scaled by some coefficients a1 and b1 and the second equation uh, by some coefficients a2 and b2 and they are equal to some number uh, c1 on the top and c2 on the bottom here. Uh, so we have two equations and two unknowns and if you recall from earlier uh, algebra courses uh, if you have n equations that are independent of one another uh, and what I mean by that is for example they're not uh, any one of those equations are not a scaled version of the other they're just they are independent uh, so if you have n independent equations, you would you'd be able to find n uh, unknowns. Uh, so if you had, for example, um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but if you had, for example, 10 equations and 10 variables, x1, x2, all the way through x10, as long as the equations were independent, uh, you'd be able to find all uh, variables, x1 through x10. So the question here is, how do we solve for x1 and x2? Um, if you recall from earlier courses, you had two methods, uh, which were substitution and el elimination. The idea behind substitution is to isolate one variable, and uh, once you do that, you plug it into the remaining equ equation and find the other variable. For elimination, you subtract one equation from the other after you properly scale it, so you can cancel one variable out fully. Uh, and the goal there is also to isolate one variable and then um, uh, do the remaining step and plug it into the remaining equation. So in this case, let's uh, let's solve this example uh, with two different methods, so substitution and elimination. So we have 6x1 plus 4x2 equals negative 14 and x1 minus 2x2 equals negative 13. We're going to uh, first do substitution. So what are we going to do? We're going to solve for x1. Uh, so we're going to move this uh, 2x2 to the other side, so we're going to add it to both sides to cancel it from this side on the left side. So x1 is going to equal negative 13 plus 2x2, pretty easy there. Uh, and uh, the idea here is I'm going to take x1 now, which I just found, I'm going to plug that into uh, the first equation uh, in parentheses, and that is shown here. You have uh, 6 times that quantity x1 plus 4 times x2 is equal to minus 14 or negative 14 so you you distribute it through you get negative 78 
plus 12 x2 uh, plus 4x2 equals negative 14. You solve for, you combine 4 and 12, you get 16. You take 78 to the other side, and you get x2 is equal to 4. And you take the x2 value you found, and you plug that into uh, the original equation you uh, found here. So you get 2 times 4, which is 8, minus 13. That's going to give you negative 5. So... We did it, in, we did it uh, via substitution, now let's do it by elimination. So I'm going to list the equations again here, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to multiply 6 by R2 to scale it. When I do that, I get 6 times x1 minus uh, 6 times 12, 2 is 12, and uh, <clears throat> 6 times negative 13 is negative 78. Then I'm going to take R1, which is equation or row 1, and I'm going to subtract 6 times row 2 from it. So I'm going to take equation 1 and subtract uh, a scaled version of equation 2 from it. And what that's going to give me is 16x2 um, is equal to 64. Uh, if I divide by 16, I would get x2 is, x is equal to 4. Then I'm going to plug that value in into the original equation here. And I will find that x1 is equal to negative 5 also. So that these two different methods show us that we get the same answer. And graphically, if you'd like to see this, uh, what you would have to do is first uh, create some axes x1 and x2. And then we're going to solve uh, x1 in terms of x2 for both equations. I'm going to assume that I'm going to think of x1 as my y-axis and my x2 as my uh, x-axis, if you will. And once I solve these equations in terms of x2, uh, I'm going to... Uh, uh, begin looking at each one of them and try to plot them. So if I look at the first equation here, uh, if I plug in x2 is equal to 0, uh, I'll be at this location, x2 is equal to 0, which is here, and that's going to tell me the value of x1. If that's uh, if x2 is 0 out, that's going to be 2 thirds times x2. So what I have remaining is x1 is equal to negative 7 thirds, which is slightly smaller than negative 2. And you can see that I've indicated that here, that's that one point there and uh, if you look at some other point x2 is equal to 10 uh, you could uh, substitute that in and you would find that uh, it looks like I've deleted the values there but you find that it is this point at uh, 10 negative 9 is what you would find that would be the coordinates so let me just write that 10 negative 9 would be the coordinates let's just verify that really quickly uh, so x1 is equal to negative 7 thirds minus 2 thirds times 10. That is negative 7. Let's put everything over 3 and minus 20. Uh, that is uh, negative 27 over 3, which is negative 9. And that confirms my y value or x1 value, which is over here. So that confirms that. Uh, then I draw the line here and I look at equation 2. Uh, and I plug in x2 is equal to 0, so some special points that I can use as boundaries. So x2 is equal to 0 is going to give me negative 13. So I go all the way down here to negative 13. I draw my first point in orange. Then uh, I'm going to plug in x1 is equal, or x2 is equal to, um, let's see, 5. What is that going to give me? x1 is equal to negative 13 plus 2 times 5. That is going to give me, that's a 10 there, that's going to give me a negative 3. So at the, at the location x2 is equal to 5, I'm going to have a negative 3 is my y value or x1 value. I plot that there, then I draw the lines, and lo and behold, I would see that they intersect at uh, 4, negative 5, as we saw in the, in the previous uh, example. So what this is telling me is these are three different basic methods to find solutions to uh, algebraic equations or simultaneous equations and they really represent the same thing. from a system perspective they're telling you uh, if, if, if you were to assume that we have one system and each equation represents some subsystem or one component of the system what it is telling you is that it is telling you what each variable should be such that the system is balanced in some manner so for example uh, if you look in if you think in, in the context of circuit we could have a situation where we have some 
voltage source or some sort of source and you have some uh, resistors followed by another resistor and another type of source either voltage or current source and basically if you were to apply a KVL here this is just an, a very crude example so if you were to apply KVL here uh, the first uh, equation would represent the this particular loop and the voltages uh, voltage rises and uh, voltage drops across each component and how they relate to the current and how they uh, equate to zero basically you would say uh, minus the voltage here as you go up uh, plus the voltage here and plus the voltage here depending on the polarities you choose but the idea is the same you sum across there rises and falls that should equal zero in the second loop you would say the same thing you would say you would go up and say okay uh, sum this voltage rise or drop sum this and sum this and set that equals zero and with your two different variables i1 and i2 your goal would be to find uh, this the set of values for these two variables i1 and i2 such that uh, the system is balanced so that the um, the system is satisfied in uh, in other words uh, you want to find a current where uh, these systems connect correctly and uh, you have the correct voltages and currents through and across each element that's the base that's it that's to get a gist of what this is telling you in the context of um, uh, engineering and in the context of circuit analysis we're trying to connect the abstract ideas in math to actual uh, circuit or physics problems. All right, so now let's begin talking about how to represent uh, linear equations in matrix form. So the first question you might ask yourself is why would I want to do such a thing and why is that useful? Uh, so in practical situations, uh, we're not going to be sitting around as an engineer or as a scientist uh, and doing uh, math on paper for very long at least. We may do that initially, but Eventually, you'd like to let the computer do all of the uh, uh, grunt work, basically, to do all of the uh, calculations that are just tedious and uh, require a lot of time. So what we do is that, depending on the application, uh, you would uh, find some data some from some experiment or uh, whatever source it may be, uh, from galaxies, from from uh, telescopes, whatever the data may be from any field of science or engineering, you would then turn this into a uh, some sort of equation. If you're lucky, these would be linear equations to where you can say, okay, some coefficient times variable one plus some coefficient plus uh, times variable two, dot, 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 and so on and so forth. So the only uh, operations here would be multiplication and addition or subtraction. And that's if, if you're lucky, we can do such a thing or we can linearize the model. Uh, so if we do such a thing, if we can get the equations, we then want to be able to put that into the computer and let the computer do all of the grunt work, the, t the tedious work. And we'll just want to be able to use the data that is calculated to do some useful thing. So the, that is the intuition here. We want to, or that is the uh, motivation here is we want to, uh, use matrices to be able to, uh, do these computations faster and faster. So if you look at this set of equations here you can see that I have n equations so or in this case m equations so uh, the first index here on the left would be my number of rows or number of equations so that's one two three and so on and so forth all the way up to m as Mary and uh, if you look at the number of columns that is my second index here and that's going to be one two three four and so on until you get to n uh, so that is my number of columns now the sizing for the matrix then or the equations would be uh, n would have to be greater than one and so more than one equation and n greater than one so more than one column uh, or more than one variable basically because um, otherwise that's a trivial case right that's just something times x1 equal to some number that's very trivial that doesn't require require linear algebra or matrices um, so here i'm saying m is equal to n so why is that so if you recall from uh, a few minutes ago we talked about if you have n linear equations that are independent of each other so they're not scaled so one equation is not a scaled version of the other uh, you would need n equations to uh, solve for those n independent uh, uh, variables basically so that is why i'm saying m is equal to n because you have you would have to have n 
independent equations uh, to be able to find those uh, or solve each one of those n variables. Now let's go ahead and put these put these equations into matrix form. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take all of the coefficients and list them uh, in the same square shape, uh, in the same format, and just plug them into uh, this matrix here. And what I'm going to do then is I'm going to put all of the variables. We can see that they're repeated everywhere. They're they're repeated everywhere, whereas the coefficients are not. The coefficients are unique. At each index, there is one coefficient. Those are unique. But we can see that all of these x1, x2, 3, xn, they show up in every single equation. So why not let's just sort of factor it out, if you will, in a way if you're factoring this out, and make it into what's called a column vector. And that is my column vector. Column vector. It's, it's sort of, the way I think about it is it's sort of a linear algebra way of factoring out. Um, similar to a regular algebra where you factor numbers out, out of parentheses and whatnot. So we we sort of gather this column vector here and what we do then is, the way I think about what goes on here is, imagine that I take um, what's called the transpose, but we're not going to worry about that right now, but I would take the transpose of this col column vector, it would look something like this. And this is just the way I like to think about it so it doesn't, uh, when I was first learning this, I use it to think about it this way so it didn't confuse me. So imagine that I just take the, the, the column vector and I just put it on its side. I, I make this column fall, I push it this way and it falls down. And if you do that, you can see that this lines up nicely over here. And I just imagine that I sweep this through to each single one and I just sort of multiply it out. So I would have the same thing you see up there, the same uh, equations. So why am I saying this? So that's sort of what I think about to be able to understand uh, what's going on here. So I'm saying that uh, this matrix of coefficients, full of coefficients, multiplied by the column vector, which is uh, which which gives me the uh, the composal of the variables that I'm looking for. So this is what I'm really looking for: these variables x1 through xn. That is all equal to some another column vector, which is composed of some values now. So I had some matrix. It did something. It did some sort of transformation. It it multiplied to this other matrix or a column vector. And it gave me a new column vector. And um, um, the sizing then would be n by n or n by n because we said that's the condition. It has to be the same um, size. And the rule here is that uh, your, for sizing is that for you to, to be able to multiply matrices, your outermost dimension for um, the first matrix and the innermost dimensions of the or the leftmost dimension of the uh, column vector should or matrix should be equal. And we can see here that they're both equal, they're n. What does that mean? It means that uh, the number of columns here should match the number of rows in the column vector. That's basically what that means. And you saw why. Because it has to be the same number to be able to line up nicely and multiply through. So that is that concept. Um, so now what are we doing here? What exactly does this mean and how is this helping us? So there's this channel on YouTube that I really actually like. I saw it a few years ago when I was taking uh, linear algebra. It's called 3 blue, 1 brown. If you'd like more intuition, because I don't have the software or the uh, linear algebra uh, or um, uh, software or the, uh, the tools needed to make such a thing, nor really the time, nor the expertise, I would refer you to this channel and look at the playlist called The Essence of Linear Algebra essence of linear algebra if you'd like more intuition on what's going on uh, with uh, linear algebra and matrix operations and whatnot uh, but uh, the philosophy that I like there is that it shows you what's going on and the way I like to think about these operations is that okay let's assume the fundamental premise of linear algebra in my uh, from what I see the essence of it is that uh, you have uh, let me draw this more nicely so imagine that you have just a uh, everything's in two dimensions so you have your X and Y but I'm going to call it I hat and J hat these are very typical engineering and uh, uh, physics based uh, coordinate systems so that's your X and Y basically these are uh, unit vectors so I should really be drawing this as such so I should have an I, I hat vector here and a J hat vector here which is in my y direction, if you will. So the idea here is that uh, I have these 
what's called basis vectors and let me just move these in I have some space I have a 2d space and I have these basis vectors I had in J hat and basically just like a, car, a normal Cartesian coordinate system I want to be able to represent any point in space uh, via some value so I get I, I by some linear combination so for example if I want to represent um, two um, three the point two three here the point two three here what I would do is I would say okay uh, let's multiply I hat by two and add it to so let's say two I hat plus um, three j hat and that's going to be my uh, new point uh, whatever I want to call it beta so basically that's sort of what's going on here you're scaling uh, you're doing linear operations to these basis vectors to be able to represent any point in space and you can see that uh, by simply uh, changing the coefficients and the signs and just addition and subtraction you're able to represent any point in this space so now let's think about what uh, matrix multiplication or uh, linear transformations mean in this context what would they be doing uh, how do they relate to these basis vectors so the basic idea is that if I have some matrix uh, let's just first name these so normally they uh, in a linear algebra course they would name this uh, matrix A they would name uh, this column vector here the variable x hat or uh, uh, x put a vector on top and they would name uh, what's on the other side as uh, yeah this is these are vectors these are column vectors and a is a matrix so what's going on here is that you have some matrix operating on a uh, column vector or just vector if you want to think about it like that and that is equal to a b hat so what's going on here is that uh, you have a set of bases a, a set of variables and by applying some matrix to it you get to a new location basically so you can imagine that uh, you have these basis functions and you apply some transformation to them and it that transformation takes you to a new um, takes each of them to a new location you can imagine that that is what's going on let's just say that's this transformation I'm not sure what that transformation would be numerically without actually going through it but this is what would have happened um, actually let me put it this way so I would call this uh, this would have to relate to B somehow so I would say I don't know B1 for example and B2 each uh, one and two being the uh, columns and one starting from left and two uh, going to the right so and that's just some transformation there and that is A uh, that is the basic idea behind uh, what we're trying to do here and if you were to uh, uh, and to find X then you'd have to get the uh, a inverse and apply it to both sides and what you would get is that uh, a inverse and a would give you the identity matrix uh, and that gives you an identity matrix with uh, applying on X would just remain x is basically that's sort of like multiplying by one so then you would have x is equal to a inverse uh, multiplied by b basically so this is the way you would find uh, the variable x or the column vector x is by taking the uh, sort of going back from uh, the operation here so a uh, works on a transforms x and moves it into b and A inverse uh, looks at B and applies an inverse transformation on B to take you back to X, to take you back to uh, the original uh, coordinates, and that helps you find what uh, X is, the variables are. So this is not going to be a very comprehensive uh, lecture on linear algebra, as I am no expert in linear algebra, and uh, because there's more great works out there that uh, I'm not going to try and recreate because that uh, becomes counterproductive given that we're, our, our aim is uh, learning circuit analysis so we're just going to use the useful tools and uh, that we get from linear algebra and i will refer you to uh, some inspirational or good sources that i've seen in the past 
and the, the, the top one that comes to mind is a uh, three blue one brown and Khan Academy of course needs no introduction but I will uh, write the name down just in case Khan Academy there's also professor uh, Gilbert Strang from MIT which I and I liked his lectures Gilbert Strang so there's just a few sources for linear algebra uh, content if you'd like to uh, know more and uh, again we're not going to delve very deeply we're only going to take what we need for circuit analysis at least an introductory course um, all right so now let's go ahead and look at some examples for multiplying matrices uh, the example here asks us to check if the matrices below can be multiplied if so, uh, we're asked to find the result for each multiplication. Before we even do that, though, let's very quickly just go over matrix addition. The reason I didn't make a separate example is because it's so simple that I don't think it deserves an entire example onto itself. So let's say that I had some matrix 1, 2, 3, 4, and you're going to see that I'm going to use this sequence very often. And I wanted to add another matrix to it. So the idea here is that we the dimensions have to be exactly the same for us to be able to add these together because otherwise it's not going to make sense for us to be able to add a matrix if the dimensions are not exactly the same as you can see we have a 2 by 2 here and a 2 by 2 so uh, the rows are there's two rows so that's two and the columns are uh, two as well so uh, the order is rows by columns and you can see here rows by columns and since they match you would be able to add these together and the way you'd add them is you take each corresponding uh, index and add it to the value in that index for the for the uh, second matrix. And you could also add many, many more matrices here, uh, if pro provided that they're, they had the same dimension, two by two, uh, like this one. So in this case, it would be one and one because that one and two because that is the index one one for each matrix. That would be a three. Then you have a two and a three here. That would be a five. You have a three and a four, which is a seven and you have a 4 and a 5 which would be 9 when added together. Very simple example and that's why I didn't make an entire example out of it. So now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about multiplication. So in uh, example A, uh, we see this matrix, it is a 2 by 2. Again, rows by column, so there's 1, 2 and 1, 2 here. And in this second uh, column vector though, um, we can see that we have a 3 by 1. So three rows and one column. And if you recall, we mentioned that uh, we have to have the inner dimensions here. The number of columns for the first uh, matrix have to match the number of rows for the second uh, uh, vector or ma matrix. And for that reason, we, since they don't match, we can't actually go out and multiply these. Another way to think about it is if you tip this column vector over to the left, if you push it here and imagine that you're tipping it over, you see that we have a one, two, three here. And that does not, that's not correct because we have an extra uh, number here and that's not going to, uh, that, that entry there is not going to be able to uh, dimensionally match uh, for multiplication and therefore uh, we cannot uh, multiply these matrices. Um, so let's say uh, not applicable and slash A. Now let's go to part B. We see here that we have a 2 by 1. Uh, two rows and one column and on the second one we have a uh, one row and four columns so that's a one by four we can see that the inner dimensions match and also additionally uh, the, the dimension of the new matrix uh, uh, the resultant matrix would be a two by four that's the other fact that uh, I have to mention here so we know that we're going to have some matrix that is two by four let me say equal here it is going to be a two by four so two entry two rows and uh, four uh, columns. So the way you you know how to um, go about this is then, then you have to think that okay I have uh, one row here, uh, one entire row and one column here. The way I would go about this is given this dimension I would for each row I would go ahead and multiply uh, this first entry here the one one multiply that through and write the results down so I have a one times one that's a one, one times two is a two and so on and so forth here as you can see which is multiplied by one. Then I go to the second row and I uh, look at the second uh, row entry here for the first uh, column vector. And then I go ahead and multiply that through by each corresponding entry on the second uh, vector. And you would see that it's a row vector in this case. 
you would get uh, 2 times 1 is 2, 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times 3 is 6, and 2 times 4 is 8. So that is the final answer in this case. And let's go ahead and move on to the third example. In this case, we have a uh, first, let's look at the dimensions again. Uh, we have a 3 by 3 multiplied by a 3 by 1 matrix so, or column vector, uh, which is just a special case of a matrix. Uh, we can see that the, the inner dimensions match here, so that is good. We're able to multiply these, and the resultant uh, matrix is going to have a size of 3 by 1, so that is going to equal a 3 by 1 matrix. Let me extend it because we have to do further operations here. So it's going to be a 3 by 1, so 3 rows and 1 column. Now let's go ahead and uh, see how we would go about doing this. So the way this works is, again, you have to think that you're tipping this column vector over the second one, and it looks something like this, 1, 2, and 3. And imagine that I'm sweeping this through to each row, and I'm multiplying the uh, corresponding values here, 1 to 1, 2 to 2, 3 to 3. And uh, whatever I get there, I'm going to add all of them and put it into one uh, index here, uh, put it into one entry here. And that is why we have a 1 here. We have a 3 by 1, so one entry per row is essentially what we're going to have here. So I'm going to go ahead and go through this. So we're going to have a uh, 1 times 1 plus a 2 times 2 plus a 3 times 3. So 1 times 1 plus 2 times 2 times a uh, or plus a 3 times 3. The other way to go about this is you can think okay, 1 times 1, 2 times 2, and 3 times 3. You're going to add the results for each and put them into one, in, one entry here. Uh, the next one is 4 times 1, 5 times 2, and 6 times 3. 4 times 1, 5 times 2, plus 6 times 3. And lastly, we're going to have a 7 times 1, 8 times 2, and a 9 times 3. 7 times 1, 8 times 2, and a 3 times 9. Now I'm going to simplify that into one 3 by 1 uh, column vector, and that's going to be a 1 plus 4 plus a... Uh, let's see, 9, that's going to be 14. Then I'm going to have a 4 plus a 10 plus a 18. So that's going to be uh, 18 and 10 is going to be 28. And that's going to be a 32. And lastly, we're going to have a, a 27, a 16, which is going to give me a, a 43 and a, a, and a 7, which is 50. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about methods of solving linear equations. Uh, as you saw in the beginning of the video, I did an example of uh, substitution, uh, which was for alge alge algebraic uh, problems involving linear equations. Uh, and since we did that, we're no longer going to do that here. We're, uh, we're going to focus on matrix methods now. And uh, those are going to be Gaussian elimination, Kramer's, Kramer's rule, matrix inversion, and numerical methods. Uh, we're not going to focus on numerical methods uh, for these lecture series unless uh, possibly later if it comes up, but uh, mainly we're going to focus on these three methods for matrices. Uh, so Gaussian elimination is very similar to substitution in the sense that, in essence, what it's doing is we're going to eliminate uh, some variables in uh, our equations and solve for others or substitute for others. So uh, before we do Gaussian elimination, we need to get the a matrix in what's called the augmented form. Uh, let's just learn my example. So let's just take a very simple 2 by 2 matrix and uh, that is multiplied by 2 by 1 column vector uh, with some uh, result. Let's take that and uh, turn that into a augmented matrix and then perform Gaussian elimination. Uh, so uh, let's at any at every point let's keep in mind that this matrix uh, operation is represented by or what it's really trying to do is represent these two linear equations here, as we talked before, um, x1 and x2 are going to get multiplied through by each, uh, by the appropriate coefficients, and then be set equal to 3 and 15 here. So let's just keep that in mind throughout. And our goal then is to find x1 and x2, or to isolate them by themselves. Or in other words, uh, we want to have it so that uh, we get something like this. We get something called the identity matrix. And then the uh, variables x1 and x2 and set equal to some number alpha beta. We don't know what it is yet, uh, but we're going to find a solution there. So 
why do we care why do we care about the identity matrix well if you think about it what this, what this multiplication is doing it's saying okay let's multiply x1 and x2 and add them together and set them equal to alpha in this case and uh, beta in the uh, second row uh, and what is that going to be it's going to be a x1 times 1 plus 0 times x2 so x2 is going to get eliminated and that's equal to alpha so it's going to tell you that x1 is equal to alpha and similarly here x2 is going to be equal to beta because 0 is going to get multiplied by x1 and, and take it away for the second equation so as you can see that is why we care about the identity matrix and why we want to get it to that form so let's go ahead and uh, first put this into the uh, augmented matrix and all that means is the following so I'm going to uh, take this matrix and uh, write it in this manner 5 2 negative 3 and 3 I'm going to draw a line here and put the final results in the same uh, corresponding rows and that is all we mean when we say the augmented matrix uh, you could also just have the brackets but I uh, when I work with augmented matrices I usually just uh, do, do like a big parentheses here which is the same thing really uh, so there's just an array of arrays of numbers and we just want to keep them organized and in the correct uh, rows so now we have to go ahead and uh, do Gaussian elimination and the idea is I want to get the left hand side uh, the actual coefficient matrix I want to get it to look like the identity matrix, which as you recall, it's going to be a 1, 0, 0, 1. So that is the goal, but do keep in mind that we're working with equations. And when we change the left-hand side in any way, we have to also do the same thing to the right-hand side. So for example, if I want to uh, eliminate the 3 on the bottom here, I'm going to need to... Uh, Add or subtract the first equation to it with some coefficient multiplier to take to get rid of the three. So uh, when I do it to the left hand side, I must also do it to the right hand side. So that's something to keep in mind as we go through. So let's go ahead and uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and just uh, work with this then. So I'm going to write down the augmented matrix five, two, negative three, and three, and three, fifteen. And what I'm going to do is just write down the operation that I'm going to do. So I'm going to draw an arrow here and write down what I'm going to do. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say let row 2. Let me do a different color here so it's easier for it to stand out. I'm going to say that let, let row 2 equal to uh, whatever it is originally plus 3 fifths times row 1. So you might wonder how I did this, and uh, one way to think about this is in programming, in the, similar to programming, where you say, okay, row two is this row, and it's just, think of it like a variable. I want to make it so that it's whatever it was originally plus some other variable. That's basically how I think about it. So you might ask, how did I go about finding, uh, choosing these uh, coefficients and these variables? The idea was, okay, I want to eliminate uh, three over here. Uh, to get to the ultimate goal of getting it to look like the identity matrix. The, the, the coefficient matrix here has to look like the identity matrix 1, 0, 0, 1. And so my goal is to get it to look like that. So the first thing I'm going to do is I want to eliminate this 3 here. So I'm going to say row 2 is whatever it is plus 3 fifths times row 1. And you can see that the file would cancel and I would have a minus 3 plus 3, but let me write that out in case it's uh, difficult. The other thing to note is that at any point when I'm working on some row I'm gonna leave the other row uh, unchanged and just write it down so it's easy so I don't have to hold anything in my memory I'm gonna say okay I'm not doing anything here to row one at least I'm not sto overwriting row one with anything only row two is being overridden if you will uh, in programming uh, terms so I'll write five two and three here and I'll go ahead and do the operation so I'm gonna have minus three here plus three fifths of five so minus 3 plus 3 fifths of 5 you can see that the 5 cancels gives me a 1 and I have a minus 3 plus a 3 here which is 0 and also I'm gonna have a uh, I need to extend this a bit because we don't have space uh, let's have again 2 3 and then the end of the bracket so then uh, I'm gonna have a um, 3 
which is in row two, three plus three fifths of two. So three plus three fifths of two. And also I'm gonna have a 15 because it's part of row two. I'm gonna have a 15 plus three fifths of row one, which is three. And the final answer there is gonna be a five, two, three there. And what did I calculate on the right hand side here? I had uh, two times three is uh, nine over five. Uh, I have to get a common denominator. Five times 15 is uh, 75. I had a nine and a 75. I got an 80, uh, let's see, with the 84 I had. So that's an 84 over five here. And let's see, on the left hand side, I have a zero as I said. And then I have a, a get a common denominator. I have a 15 plus a six, which is a uh, 21 over five. And I'm gonna go ahead and write that down here and continue. Okay, so I'm one step closer to getting my coefficient matrix on the left uh, to look like the identity matrix. So now I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, do something here to make, uh, to have a zero one here. So what I would have to do is I would have to uh, overwrite or rewrite what's in R2, row two, by um, five twenty-first or five over 21 times R2. So whatever it is, just multiply the whole thing through, the whole equation through with a five over 21. Why did I do that? It's because I wanna have a one in place of 21 over five. Again, I'm not doing anything to rule one, so I'm just gonna write it down to not have to hold anything in my head. And I'm gonna have a, uh, uh, 5 21st or 5 over 21 times 0 is 0. 5 over 21 times 21 over 5 is 1. Uh, 5 over uh, 5 and 5 cancel here and I have an 84 over 21. 84 over 21 which gives me a 4. That's going to go there. Uh, now let's write it again down here and continue. I have a 5, 0, 2, 1, 3, 4. Now I need to change the top. So the first thing I'm going to do up top is I need to have a one zero here. So let's go ahead and uh, what I want to do is I want to get row one to be one fifth of row one. Why? Because I want to have turn to five into one. So what's going to happen there is I'm going to have uh, five times uh, one over five is one, two over five is going to be here, and a three over five is going to show up here. I'm going to leave the unchanged row as is. And finally, I'm going to do a final operation to get my identity matrix and get the final result. So here, I need to, what I need to do now is eliminate this guy, the two fifths, uh, and turn it into zero. So what I'm going to do there is I'm going to say, okay, R1 is what needs to be changed. So say R1 is equal to uh, whatever um, I need to have two fifths, so it's going to be whatever it was minus two fifths of uh, R2 because I have a one here. So if I multiply two fifths and take it away from here, I'm going to have a zero where I need it to be zero. So what I get there is uh, um, let's get the bottom side, which is unchanged, just write that down and let's look at the top now. So I'm going to have. 1 minus whatever times 0 is 0, so that's just 1. It's going to remain unchanged. Then I have a 2 fifths minus a 2 fifths, which is 0. Then I have a 3 fifths minus a 4 times 3 fifths. So uh, 3 fifths minus a 4 times a uh, 2 fifths. And what I'm going to get here is a uh, 3 minus 8 over 5. That's a minus 5 over 5, which is negative 1. And so the final answer is uh, minus 1, 4 here. Now recall that uh, uh, when you have the identity matrix 1, 0, 0, 1, that's telling you that x1, uh, so what that's telling us, let's look at it again, so 1, 0, 0, 1, that's telling us that this would be a 1, let's do it in different colors, that's a 1, that would be a 0, that's a 0, that would be a 1, that's telling me that 1 times x1 equals 3 and 1 times x2 is equal to 15, so I, I'm able to find the final result that way. So that is the basic idea behind Gaussian elimination. I figured we'd do a uh, learn something by example uh, to have it be clear. And this takes some practice. And if you don't know which step to do exactly, just think of what your goal is, which is to get the identity matrix. And um, 
let's write the final result here it just takes practice and there's not not really any other substitution for it only practice so let's have x1 is equal to negative 1 and x2 here is equal to recall that this is x1 x2 x1 x2 so x1 is negative 1 and x2 is equal to 4 that is my final answer okay so now let's go ahead and talk about determinants Determinants are a very fundamental concept in linear algebra and uh, before we look at the definition or any examples let's consider what we're actually after here what are we looking for so as far as engineers are concerned uh, we're looking for how to solve uh, this following uh, matrix uh, or linear transformation so we talked about how uh, we have some uh, unknown uh, column vector x hat or x bar um, uh, in other words, x vector, you, you could call it that. And uh, this linear transformation is going to uh, transform my uh, vector x into some new vector b. Uh, the idea here is that I want to find, um, I want to be able to, uh, given a and b, I want to be able to go back and find x. That's the basic idea. And as you saw, we had some, uh, some, coefficient matrix here on the left that was multiplied by my uh, uh, unknown variables here my column vector and that gave me some number alpha beta that's also a column vector so given uh, these two matrices or vectors I want to be able to find my unknowns that's the basic premise that's the basic idea behind uh, applied linear algebra or the al linear algebra that we're looking for uh, when we're trying to solve circuit problems in our case so let's talk about something that's useful in terms of uh, visualizing what a determinant is so consider that you have some basis vectors here i hat and j hat i hat is some vector that points from zero to uh, the origin to uh, uh, x equals one if you want to call this the x and y axis um, and j hat is one where uh, it points from the origin to y equals one and he has no x component so they're independent uh, in their own two dimensions so each one has uh, each one can span uh, its own dimension and you can use it to basically locate any point on the x-axis for i hat and locate any point on the y-axis for j hat so when i write the identity matrix one zero zero one for a two-dimensional uh, problem what i'm saying here is that uh, my first column vector here the, the by the way these can also be column vectors so uh, what's in the matrix here a two by two matrix here the the first entry the first column would be its own column vector which represents the uh, i hat uh, vector because it's telling you okay x equals one y equals zero if you will so x equals one y equals zero is representing i hat and the second one is the second column vector is uh, x equals zero y is equal to one so x equals zero y equals one that's j hat so that's the that's what the uh, that is what the uh, uh, identity matrix represents graphically. If you want to think about it, now uh, suppose we had some new matrix where that was multiplied, that transformed. So my A was uh, the following. So it was, for example, um, two, five. Um, uh, let's see. I want to make sure it matches my diagram. So it has to be something. Uh, greater there let me see let me make sure it's uh, gonna match my schema my diagram here it's gonna transform I to let's say 2 1 so 2 1 and it's gonna transfer J hat to negative 2 2 negative 2 2 okay so what am I doing here so uh, what this is doing here is giving you the location of the new uh, of the transformed vector so it's telling you okay originally I had 1 0 0 1 now I'm going to go from, for the first column vector, 1, 0, which is I hat. I'm going to go from 1, 0 to a new location, 2, 1. So it's going to be now 1, 2, 1 up here. That's going to be my new location for the basis vector I hat. And the other vector is going to now be at negative 2 and 2 in the same coordinate system. So a negative 2, negative 1, 2, and go up 2 is 2. So that is my new um, location. So what this is doing is it's transforming my basis vectors to a new location and that is uh, uh, 
that is going to have a few different changes. So first of all, the coordinates, of course, are going to change in the same coordinate system. And also, uh, there's something here that is the area that is bounded by, uh, by these two uh, basis vectors. And a lot of this is borrowed from three, uh, the channel 3 blue, 1 brown. So again, I would encourage you to uh, visit the channel and look at their look at his uh, linear algebra playlist if you want a better understanding of what's going on and better visualizations. I'm going to draw very crude visualizations here. So we have a unit uh, area here. We have some square with dimensions 1, 1. That's my, uh, the 1, 0, and 0, 1. That's my one uh, unit here. And uh, in the new transformation, what we did was uh, we now have a new, we stretched space. We stretched the space between these two basis vectors to where uh, it is now a greater area. So you can imagine that I uh, transformed each vector into these new locations and the square that is between the two that's bounding the area between the two is now stretched. As you can imagine that I grab this red vector and I stretch it to the uh, northwest or top uh, left and I took the green and I stretch it to the top right and uh, that also stretched the area between them if you will. So they, the idea behind, behind the uh, determinant is I want to find out uh, what happened to my area here? I want to find out. I had an area of one here that was bounded between the two basis vectors. I want to find out how that scaled. So that's what I'm saying here is that the determinant is a measure of the scale factor by which the transformation, which is what happened to these, uh, what the matrix A did to my uh, basis vectors. I want to find out by what factor, the scaling factor, did the area of this. Uh, of this square change and that's the determinant and this really only works in lower dimensions one two and three dimensions when we get to higher dimensions it doesn't really make much sense at least in my brain uh, to think about it uh, graphically so that is the basic idea of a determinant now let me just go ahead and give you the formula for the determinant of a uh, of a uh, two by two simple matrix and uh, for one, the determinant, so if I have A is equal to the transformation above here, uh, 2, 1, negative 2, 2, the determinant would be represented by delta, and uh, which would equal, the way you would write it is the following. So you would say, uh, you would put it into these straight lines, and you'd say 2, 1, negative 2, 2. So you would put... Uh, a into uh, that's kind of that kind of looks like an absolute value, so I'm not going to include that. So basically, you want to put your matrix into these uh, straight lines, and that's representing the uh, the determinant. And the formula for it is uh, so. Let me write it here then. So the determinant of a, b, c, d would be uh, a times d minus b times c. That is the uh, formula for it. So let's go ahead and calculate the determinant of the simple 2x2 two two matrix that we see here just to sort of uh, try to make sense of it in our brains and see uh, if it matches up with what we see here in the image, the demonstration. So uh, my A and D would be 2 times 2, 2 times 2 minus B times C which would be negative 2 times 1, so negative 2 times 1. I'm going to have a 4 minus a minus 2 which is going to be a plus 2 and my determinant would be then uh, 6 so my determinant is equal to 6 and if you look at it here it sort of makes sense in the sense that we had an area of uh, unit area of 1 by 1 and that increased by some amount here as you can see uh, that area has increased and uh, that makes sense it's not 100 it's not 50 so it kind of is uh, matching our visual analysis here of what was going on. All right, so now let's go ahead and talk about another solution for uh, solving the uh, the problem of AX equals B, which is the fundamental problem that us as engineers are going to deal with, uh, especially for circuit analysis. So the other solution is called Kramer's rule, and the basic premise is that um, for this equation of AX equals B, uh, there exists solutions 
uh, which are written as x1 is equal to the determinant sub 1 over the determinant of a, which we'll talk about what that sub 1 and sub 2 and so on means. Uh, so basically what they're saying is that the solution, uh, the solution set x1 through xn uh, for n rows and uh, n columns, uh, and also do recall that A has to be a square matrix, so it has to be n by n. So let's recall that. And uh, what is it saying is that Kramer's rule is saying that, saying that the solution set x sub n, or uh, consisting of uh, n variables, x1 through xn, has to be this modified version of the determinant of A over the determinant of A itself. And this other modified version for x2 over determinant, and so on and so forth. Now, let's recall that the delta is uh, referring to the determinant of the matrix, which is some sort of a scaling factor by which the transformation uh, modifies the unit area between the basis vectors of the original coordinate system. And the, de the uh, determinant with this subscript 1 through n, or just n, is the determinant of the matrix A with the nth column replaced by uh, the values of B, the, the B vector. So, or the solution itself, or the, sorry, or the resultant vector. Uh, so what does that mean? Let's look at an example. So this, so this is the determinant of A, which is composed of all the subcomponents of uh, matrix A, so A11 through ANN. And uh, the determinant with a subscript N is the same exact, uh, is of the same exact uh, matrix A, except that the nth column, which is on the very uh, right hand side here is replaced by the resultant vector b so that's all it means now if uh, the number here instead of n was one uh, you would just take all these uh, vectors b1 through bn and put them into the first column if it was two it'd be the second column and so on and so forth so really it requires two operations two main operations for each solution um, to uh, for each variable solution uh, for the uh, equation shown here and that is uh, two different uh, two different determinant operations or two different determinants to find and uh, that may itself involve multiple determinants depending on the dimensions of the uh, matrix A but uh, in principle it should be two operations so uh, and also I should add that uh, so uh, if you get some numbers from each determinant from each operation and then we do a division so really that's three operations but then, as I said, if you see, uh, if you break down each determinant into uh, more and more determinants, that involves many more uh, operations. Now, let's go ahead and talk about a special condition. So, uh, all of these are only valid when the determinant is non-zero. And so, I want I want you to think about why. Why would that be? I want you to go ahead and look at these diagrams that we drew, and think about why is that. So, 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 why is it that these operations? Are only valid for a determinant that is non-zero. Recall what a determinant represents and try to think about why should that be the case. So I'm assuming that you've given it some thought and I'm going to go ahead and tell you why. So recall that a determinant is telling you the scale factor by which your linear transformation uh, scaled or multiplied the area of the uh, of uh, the square that is uh, the unit square that is uh, bounding the area between i hat and j hat so in this new operation then uh, the determinant is going to be some number that's greater than one uh, so and before we do that let's go ahead and uh, talk about something that i forgot so in what case would the determinant be negative that is a case that shows up and that would be the case where the orientation of i hat and j hat with respect to each other is flipped so if i do some sort of linear transformation where I hat ends up on, uh, if you will, the left hand side of j hat, then I'll get a negative area, and that's what a negative area will represent. Uh, another way of thinking about it is the right hand rule, and you you start with i and curl curl your fingers towards j, and then your thumb pop pops out out of the page. And if i hat were on the other side of j hat, so if you had a i hat that was this way, and the j hat that was going this way, your i your fingers would start if you use your right hand and you start from i hat with your uh, all your four fingers except for your thumb and point it to the direction of j hat your your thumb would point into the board and that is uh the reverse of the vector that is your thumb and that's something that's uh, discussed in other courses and we can talk about it when we get to electromagnetics but for now uh, that is 
the right hand rule and you can think about and use that to think about uh, why the number of determinants should be the sign should be positive or negative uh, so anyways um, the answer to the question of why should this why should the determinant be non-zero for this to work is that a non-zero determinant represents an area of zero so if you think about what in what condition in what geometrical condition would this happen that is when i hat and j hat end up on the same line so some transformation happens to i hat and j hat and they end up on the same uh, line and you can see that the area between them collapses down to zero you can imagine that i take i hat here and put her onto j hat and then there's no more area between them uh this zero in terms of a matrix then what would that look like so imagine that i one for my identity matrix, which gives you the location of I had and J had originally shown up here. If I go to, for example, 2, 3, and 4, 6, you can see that what I've done is, so let's say that that's, that is 2, 3, 2, 3, and the new location is 4, 6. You can see that what I've done is, I've done something redundant. My goal was to reach this point. In space I could have really only done that with one vector I didn't need to have two vectors doing that and what this has done is made this linear uh, made this vector so that they're not linearly dependent you can see that they're linearly so that they're not linearly independent so what it's doing is making them dependent on each other so basically the second vector here is only a scaled factor of the first vector I uh, I had or vice versa uh, I had is a scale factor by one half of j hat so really this is redundant and I'm uh, what I'm doing is I'm uh, not allowing myself to span this entire two-dimensional two space and that is what that means when the determinant is zero so let's go ahead and calculate the determinant of this guy as we said it's going to be two times six two times six minus three times four which is three times four which is twelve what do we get we get two times six is twelve minus twelve that's zero and that's another confirmation of what we were talking about. So in summary, the reason we have to have a non-zero determinant is that a zero determinant represents linearly dependent vectors, uh, transformed basis vectors, and uh, uh, they determine that. And geometrically, that's just telling us that the area between the basis vectors is zero. All right. So now let's go ahead and uh, look at the general case where you have some matrix A that is uh, n by n in size and you want to find the determinant uh, in that case so what you would do is you would go ahead and say okay let me start with the first row or first column and uh, go through and do the following calculation so I would say okay let's take the first entry 1 1 and multiply it by some matrix M 1 1 subtract A 1 2 multiply some matrix M 1 2 plus A 1 3 uh, times matrix M13 and so on and so forth and the formula is uh, for the coefficient to, to determine if it's positive or minus or negative you say negative 1 2d 1 plus n where n is your uh, nth row or nth column times a1n times m1n uh, so that's if we expand along the rows so we start with a1 and go through to a1n we could also expand through or sorry that's if you go through columns we could also expand by rows and we would do that by going a11 and all the way to a21 and an1 with the same exact form now the question is what is this matrix m uh, this matrix m so the matrix m i j so the matrix m with uh, with uh, entry uh, or index uh, variables i and j is the determinant of the matrix formed by striking out the ith and jth column of a uh, and the, the size is of uh, the size is n minus 1 times n minus 1 which makes sense because if we uh, if we cross out the ith and jth column or row so let's say that um, it is m11 so the matrix is uh, the matrix is going to be uh, the determinant of a uh, which is normally what it would be uh, the determinant of a is what what is shown here now the matrix m11 would be uh, the column and row correspond to the a11 being crossed out. So if I cross out, if I cross out this column and this row, uh, so what is vertical and perpendicular to a11, that's going to give me the determinant of the remaining, uh, the remaining elements here. That's going to be my m11, 
and it makes sense that the size is n minus 1 times n minus 1 because I, I took away one column and one row. So that makes sense. Now n1, 2 would be if I uh, started with 1, 2 and I st striked out the row that n uh, a12 is in and the column that a12 is in. In that case, my entries would be uh, everything that remains, basically. That's going to be the new determinant. So with that being said, uh, we're going to, and if you're a little confused about this, we're going to see some examples. So the two most common matrices that we're going to see are 2x2 two two and 3x3s. Three and therefore, it makes sense to do the example for these two uh, exemplar uh, matrices. In the first case, I'm going to go ahead and apply these same rules. So the idea is, okay, I want to find the determinants. I'm going to follow this rule, which is uh, I'm going to start with the uh, rows, for example. So, uh, or sorry, columns. I'm going to start with this entry here and move down columns. Uh, so I'm going to have a A11. I'm going to start with A11. Now I'm going to multiply it with M11. And remember the sign is... Uh, so I'm going to say plus negative 1 to the 1 plus n. Now n uh, for the next term is going to be uh, uh, 2. So I'm going to say 2 because that is 1, 2, and 1, 2. My next entry is uh, 2, so my n is going to be 2. That's going to be multiplied by a12 and m12. So now I need to find M12 and M11 because I finished going through all of the columns. So A11 and A12 exist here. Let me first simplify that and I get A11, M11. I have a minus sign here because I have a negative 1 to the third power, which is an odd number. So that's a minus A12 and M12. M12. Now the task is to find M12 m12 and m12 and m um, sorry m11 and m12 so m11 is going to be the uh, the uh, determinant when I look at a11 and cross out the row and column that it is associated with so it's associated with this row and this column and what I have remaining is very simple it's a determinant of one number which is going to be itself so it's a determinant with only one entry which is going to be just itself, A22. Now the M12 then is going to be, uh, if I look at uh, A12, and I cross out the uh, row or column and the row it's in, I'm going to have A21 left. So I get A21. And if I want to finalize my answer then, uh, uh, and the way I wrote this is incorrect, I should say that uh, the determinant is equal to that not a a is already given and the determinant is this so uh, now the final answer is the determinant is a11 times m11 which is a22 a22 minus a12 times a21 and this makes sense from our previous uh, special case discussion of two by twos because I have a a11 times a22 minus a21 times a12 so that agrees with what we found so far. Now let's go on and find the answer for the 3 by 3 case. All right, so now let's go ahead and find the determinant of a 3 by 3 uh, matrix in general terms. And uh, we're going to do this one time tediously because it's going to be, uh, it's still not going to be any numbers, just variables. And we're going to do it because we're going to see 2 by 2s and 3 by 3 matrices a lot. And um, I don't expect that we'll go beyond 4 by 4s uh, for this lecture series. Uh, there may be some special cases, some special problem sets that if I uh, go over it with you that it might in involve more. And uh, in that case, we'll use a computer. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and uh, solve this problem. So let's remember that we could expand along or we could move along either a row or a column here. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and do it by uh, column. So I start with 1, 1, go to 1, 2, and go to 1, 3. Uh, before we do any of that, let's remember that, uh, let's find the uh, corresponding determinants M12, M, sorry, M11, M12, and M13. Let's go ahead and make our lives easier. I keep writing M12. M11, M12, 
and then one three so again I'm gonna go uh, with a, a one one a one two a one three so each one of them is gonna have a coefficient or a determinant a matrix that is gonna be multiplied that is one 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 two and one three uh, let's go ahead and find the determinant so recall that uh, the m one one is the determinant formed when I cross out uh, uh, the column and row of a11 so that is going to be if I cross out this guy and this guy you get, you see that I have a22 a23 a32 and a33 left and that's going to be a determinant we have to remember that these are determinant uh, uh, these M uh, matrices are determinants so a22 a23 a32 and a33 and we already know the result of that and that is a 2 by 2 matrix uh, the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix and we already know that so we're, we're going to do it by memory and as you can see here um, we take a big problem and we break it down into smaller pieces which is a very typical thing that we do as engineers as, uh, for solving problems so let's go ahead and uh, so we take a 3 by 3 and we break it down into steps that are involved with the determinant of a 2 by 2 let's go to find m12 now and that is the matrix the determinant formed when we cross out the column of a12 and the row of a12 so that's when you cross out the column is this uh, the row is that so we're going to have these left so we're going to have a21 a23 a31 and a33 left we do a, the 2 by 2 formula again for determinants and we have that result 3 1 now let's do the last one M13 uh, I'm gonna go and look at A13 and cross out the column and row and what I have left is the following so A21 A22 and if you're confused on what these things mean uh, at a certain point in linear algebra, at least if you are an engineer, if you're not going to be a mathematician, it might suffice to uh, memorize the procedures and don't worry too much and, uh, about uh, what they mean because they are abstract mathematical problems and uh, if we continue thinking about what these things mean, we may lose time and not be able to do our own calculations. So at some point, I'm going to go ahead and take things on faith uh, and leave it up to the mathematicians to uh, uh, do the rest so now let's go ahead and the next step is to uh, so that's the determinant of a the next step is to um, say okay um, I need to find the signs so for uh, I know I'm gonna have a11 m11 and so on and so forth but the question is what are the signs so I'm gonna write the formula negative 1 1 plus n in the first case it's going to be a 1 n is equal to 1 for the first column and row so that's plus 1 and I'm going to have a 1 1 m 1 1 then I'm going to have a negative 1 to the for the second for n equals 2 it's going to be a 1 plus 2 a 1 2 m 1 2 and for the third one it's going to be a 1 plus 3 which is here and that's going to be a 1 3 m 1 3 so for the first one you have a negative 1 squared that's a plus so a11 m11 for the second one it is a negative 1 to the third that's a minus let's take that aside let's take that away minus a12 m12 and the third case that's a a1 to the fourth that's a plus and that is a13 m13 and so finally uh, we're going to have a11 times the product that we found above which is a22 a33 minus a23 a32 a22 a33 minus a3 sorry what was that 32 23 and 32 32 and 23 then I'm gonna have a minus a12 m12 which is uh, a21 33 23 31 a21 a 33 minus a 23 a 31 and lastly I'm gonna have a plus a 13 uh, times a 21 a 32 minus a 22 a 31 that is my final 
uh, or uh, determinant which is M13. And the next steps would be would be simply to uh, go ahead and simplify these and uh, factor these into the equation. But that is just basic algebra, and I'm not going to go ahead and uh, take time for that. Um, so in summary, then um, we're trying to find Kramer's. We're trying to apply Kramer's rule, and to do that, we have to first do some uh, determinants. And these examples uh, serve to show you. Um, what it is like to work with determinants of uh, size 2x2 two two and 3x3. Three three. Uh, so now let's go ahead and do some uh, numerical examples. Alright, so in this example we are asked to use Kramer's rule to solve for the following linear equations. In other words, we want to find x1, x2 in this case and x1 through x3 for the second case using Kramer's rule. So uh, I'll let you stop the video and uh, attempt to solve these problems uh, using the skills that we've talked about. Okay, so assuming that you've tried it, I'm going to go ahead and begin solving this. So before doing anything, let's first put this into a matrix form. And I prefer to always put them in the augmented matrix form, but you can also just use the um, AX equals B format where you have uh, Where you have some matrix times uh, your unknowns equals B like so x1 x2 equals B1 B2 you can have that form or you could have the augmented matrix form which is what I have uh, here so that is the first thing to do uh, the second thing to do is to remember what Kramer's rule is telling you so uh, it's telling us that uh, the solution in this case only x1 and x2 are the unknowns we only have two variables uh, that is equal to um, the modified determinant uh, as shown as such so the, the delta sub 1 and delta sub 2 over the determinant so let's first write down what a is and a is uh, 5 2 negative 3 3 uh, let's find its determinant. So it's a 2 by 2, so I'm going to just use the 2 by 2 formula. 5 times 3 minus, uh, minus 3 times 2. Uh, that's going to be a 15. Uh, the minus and minus cancel, you get a plus 6. That is a 21. And uh, we found the first part here. The second part is to find uh, delta sub 1 and delta sub 2. So delta sub 1, if you recall, was uh, the what the matrix A if you were to uh, switch the column the kth column or nth column by whatever B is the B vector in this case it is uh, the, the subscript is 1 so I'm going to replace the first column by whatever B is so I'm going to have a 3 1 5 a 2 and a 3 so I need to find the determinant of that and let's remember that for determinants the notation is a flat line and that is equal to uh, I'm going to just apply the same formula 3 times 3 minus 2 times 15 which is equal to 9 minus uh, 30 which is minus uh, 21 so our first solution is x1 is equal to uh, uh, delta sub 1 over delta or sorry uh, yes delta the determinant uh, the, the delta sub 1 is negative 21 over the other deter the main determinant which is 21 the answer is minus 1 so x is equal to negative 1 x1 is equal to negative 1 and that is correct because uh, we solved this very problem originally with uh, Gaussian elimination so let's go ahead and uh, find the second one so uh, we already have the determinant so that's good we always solve the determinant first and then go ahead and uh, solve the modified determinants so in the f in this case we have to keep the original uh, column 1 but then switch the second column with uh, 3 and 15 so I'm going to have a 5 and a minus 3 and 3 15 5 and a minus 3 and 315 and the answer is going to be 5 times 15 minus minus 3 times 3 
So it's going to be something plus 9. Now 5 and 15 are going to be 75. These numbers are familiar from the earlier problem. That is a 80, uh, let's see, 80 what, 84. And the final answer is going to be x2 is equal to um, delta sub 2 over delta, which is going to be 84 over 21, which was the determinant. And that is equal to 4. And if you recall from earlier, that is indeed the solution to this problem by using Gaussian elimination. So we have found our complete solution set for this particular 2 by 2 uh, problem. Here's the second problem just for reference. Here are all the coefficients and all the equations. So let's go ahead and begin solving them. Okay, similar to the first problem, I've gone ahead and put it into the augmented matrix form. Instead of working with equations, we're going to work with matrices, augmented matrices. Now I'm going to go ahead and uh, write down what I'm looking for again. I'm going to say x1, x2, and x3 are equal to, again, we're using Kramer's rule to solve linear equations. So I'm going to have delta 1 over delta, delta 2 over delta, and delta 3 over delta. Again, deltas are uh, gradients. Oh, not gradients, sorry. Um, uh, deltas are uh, determinants. So the first one is going to be the determinant of 25 minus 5 minus 20 minus 5, 10. Okay, so there's our first uh, operation here is to determine the, or to find a determinant of A. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and apply the same rule. So I'm going to say, okay, uh, I'm going to go along the columns again. Uh, it's going to be 25. My coefficient is minus 1 to the 1 plus 1 because I have a n equals 1, 1 plus 1. And I have, I'm going to have m11. One, one. Uh, then I'm going to have a plus, uh, I'm going to pick the second number here, negative 5 times a negative 1 to the 1 plus 2 now, n equals 2. That's column 1, column 2, column 3, times m12 uh, plus the third entry times negative 1 to the 1 plus 3 times m13. Let's simplify it a little bit and say that's a plus, so that's a 25 m11. Let's just have m12 and m13 finished with here. And also that's a, that's a odd power times another negative. So negative 1 to the odd, to odd power is negative 1 and another negative that's plus. So that's a plus 5. And lastly that is a uh, negative 1 to the even power is going to be a positive and a negative here is a negative. So minus 20. And now let's go ahead and find m11, m12 and m13. Uh, so M11, M12, and M13. For M11, we're going to have, okay, I'm going to cross out. Uh, for A11, I'm going to look at the column, cross it out, row, cross it out. I'm going to have 10 minus 4, what remains here, negative 4, 9. For M12, I'm going to have, okay, uh, first row, second column, so that's going to be Cross that out, cross this out, that's going to be a negative 5, a negative 5, a negative 4, and a 9. And for the last one, M13, I am going to have a, uh, I'm going to cross this guy out, cross this guy out, because it's the third entry, cross out its row and column. I'm going to have a negative 5, a 10, a negative 5, and a negative 4. And let's go ahead and solve these. I'm going to have 10 times 9 minus uh, 4 times 4 is 16 and the negatives cancel. Let's just go ahead and write it for completeness sake. That is a 90 minus a 16, which is going to give me a 74. Then I'm going to have a uh, negative 5 times a 9 minus a negative 4 times a negative 5. Uh, that's going to be negative 45 plus, let's see, that's two minuses canceled, then you get another minus. 
which is going to be 20. So you get a negative 65 there. Then you're going to have a negative 5 times negative 4 minus a 10 times a negative 5. And you're going to have a 20 plus a 50, which is a 70. And I'm going to finally write all this down into the determinant. And that is going to be, so I found all my uh, determinants M1, 1, M1, 2, and M1, 3. I'm going to have a 25 times a uh, 74. I'm going to have a 5 times a M1, 2, which is negative 65. I'm going to have a minus 20 times 70. Minus 20 times 70. And my final answer is... Okay, so we found out that uh, the determinant itself is uh, 125. And as you can see, that's only a part, one-fourth of the problem. We have uh, three other determinants to figure out, which each, with each dividing down to three more determinants in some mathematical operations. So let's go ahead and just circle this answer, or square this answer, and uh, move on to other sections. So now we have to find the following. These are all determinants uh, that are modified. In this case, let me just go ahead and copy and paste some of these. Um, let me just copy the whole thing down here. Let's go ahead and copy that. So I don't have to keep writing. Um, I'll go ahead and fast forward now to where I modified all of these. Alright, I've gone ahead and uh, finished these uh, simplifications. I have uh, the determinant sub 1 here and as you, if you recall we have to what we have to do is get uh, the b vector and place it into wherever uh, the first column is and as you can see I've done that 50 0 0 for the first column for the second one it's going to be in the second place 50 0 0 here for the third one it's going to be in the third column so that is that so now we have to go ahead and find the determinants uh, for each one of these and each is going to have three different M1, M11, M12, and M13. So let's go ahead and uh, solve it now. All right, so let's go ahead and solve for the first determinant. So as you can see, I've copied the results from uh, the first problem because it's already going to be a tedious problem set. So I'm going to try to uh, fast forward things as much as possible. So I've gone ahead and just copied the equation from above and replaced the coefficients here, which come from uh, each one of these, uh, uh, the first row, so 50 minus 5 and minus 20 and as you recall uh, this negative 1 to the nth uh, 1 plus n power is going to determine the sign so that is going to be if I simplify that I'm going to have a, a positive uh, or 50 times m11 I always write m12 when I'm thinking of m11 uh, so m11 m12 and m13 then I'm going to have a uh, uh, minus 1 to the, so an odd power, that's a negative times a negative 5, that's going to be a, uh, a plus 5. And also I have a negative 1 to even power, that's a positive times a negative, that's a negative. So that is going to be what I'm looking for. So now let's go ahead and uh, find M11 through M13. Okay, so as, as you can see, uh, I've gone ahead and found these determinants. So again, M11 is going to be when I cross out the first row and column associated with the A11. I'm going to have 10, negative 4, negative 4, 9. For the second uh, row and column, I'm going to have 0, negative 4, 0, 9. For the third one, I'm going to have 0, 10, 0, negative 4. So let's go ahead and jump, just jump to solving them. Uh, then I'm going to have a minus 4 times a minus, which gives me 1, one uh, or 10 times 9, which is uh, 90. Oops, let's use the correct number. Correct color. So 90 minus 4 times 4 is 16. And I'm going to get a 74. And if we look here, I have a 0 times 9 minus a 0 times negative 4. That's a 0. 
0 times negative 4 minus a 0 times 10, that's a 0. So to, uh, to finalize then, I have a, uh, these guys go to 0, and I have a 50 times an M11, which is 74 here. So my final answer for delta sub 1 is 50 times 74, and that is, let's find out what it is, 50 times 74 is 3700 so let's go ahead and uh, box that in let's move on to the next uh, uh, section okay so now let's look at the second determinant that we have to solve uh, so as you can see here I've gone ahead and simplified again and the reason I've not included the signs is because we have to now remember or learn from the previous section that um, the previous determinant showed us that if you start with 1, 1, our coefficient is positive. So that's a plus, that's a minus, that's a plus. So I'm going to just leave it at that. And you can determine what these are. So let's go ahead and solve each um, determinant again, sub-determinant. So M11 again is going to be, when I cross these out, I have 0, negative 4, 0, 9. M12 is going to be when I cross the middle one out. And M13 is going to be when I cross the last entry out around negative 20 the column and the row and so let's go ahead and solve it so I can see that I have zeros here zero times here zero times negative four that's a zero uh, let's solve the last one I have a negative five times zero negative five times zero that's a zero uh, for the second one I have a negative five times a nine minus a negative four times a negative five that's going to give me a negative uh, 45 minus a that's a positive number that's a 20 so that's going to give me a minus uh, 65 and so my final answer is going to be um, let's see that's m12 so these are zero and my final answer is negative 50 times negative 65 which is going to give me a uh, 3250 so my delta sub 2 is 3,250. Let's box that in. Okay, so let's look at the last uh, determinant. And again, I've gone ahead and simplified things and uh, using the same logic that I demonstrated before. Let's just go ahead and jump right into it now since we've seen plenty of uh, examples for each uh, step. Uh, so that's going to give me a 10 times 0 is a 0 minus a zero is zero uh, that's also a zero answer because you can see there's going to be some sort of zero in there and our last one is going to be a negative five times a, a four or negative four minus a ten times a minus five that's going to give me a twenty minus and a minus is a plus that's a fifty which gives me a seventy overall uh, now let's see um, uh, okay, so my uh, M11 and M12 are zeroed out, and my last one is going to be a 70 here, so my delta sub 3 is going to be a 50 times a 70. Let's see what that gives us. That gives me 3500. So let's go ahead and write that 3500. Let's box that in. Now let's take all of our final results to the first page and uh, get the final solutions. All right, so for problem B, uh, recall that uh, we found all of these results. So we found that the delta for the matrix A is 125, and all the modified matrices that we saw, uh, we found the results for. And recall that for any given solution, it's going to be whatever the modified matrix result is. So delta sub 1 is for x1. So it's going to be that result divided by the determinant. And so I have the results written down here, and I'm going to just summarize them one more time for conciseness. And that is going to be a 29.6, a 26, and a 28. And so, again, what we did here is we found the solution to these set of linear equations by uh, using Kramer's rule. Now you might ask yourself, why not just use substitution? Because uh, these involved a lot more steps than just the steps required to do substitution and elimination. 
and the answer is that yes, for for a few sets of equations, it is easier to do basic algebraic skills that we learned in the past. But when you have many, many uh, different components in the equation, uh, in our case, if you have many, many different loops or nodes in a given circuit, uh, that's when it becomes helpful to use linear algebra and simply plot these or basically uh, input this into a computer and let the computer do all these different methods and uh, find a solution for us. Uh, for now, we're just doing these problems by hand and learning the basics of working with uh, matrices. And later on, when we work with computers more, uh, we'll be doing that and we'll see how these methods become useful. Okay, so let's begin talking about the last method that we're going to use to solve uh, uh, linear equations and specifically matrix problems. So uh, matrix inversion is a method to determine x uh, by uh, finding the inverse of a. So recall that uh, the original problem was to solve this particular matrix equation. You have ax equals b and what you could do is if a is a square matrix, uh, meaning that it has the same number of columns as, as, as number of rows, uh, then we can go ahead and find its inverse and we apply it to the left hand side here and A inverse and A give us the identity matrix and the final solution is uh, A inverse times B. So the inverse of A must satisfy the property that uh, if you take the A inverse multiplied by A or A times this A inverse it's going to give you the identity matrix and uh, also the fact that uh, the definition of A inverse is the adjoint of A or the determinant of A. So we know how to determine the determinant of A, but we don't know the adjoint of A, A yet. So let's go ahead and talk about that. So the adjoint of A is the transpose of the cofactors of A. So two things here that we don't know. We briefly talked about transpose before, but let's just review what it is. So if I have some matrix, um, let's call it A again let's say it's A11, A12, A21, A22 its trans transpose is going to be denoted by a T and it's simply what you would do is just look at the column and write it as a row and then continue on so I'm going to look at the column and now write it as a row instead so I'm going to have A11, A21 and I'm going to look at this next column and write it as a row a12, A22, and so on and so forth for other examples. So that takes care of transpose. Now let's talk about cofactors of A. So cofactor of A is the matrix composed of Cij, where Cij is the is negative 1 to the 1 plus n times the determinant uh, determinant of a submatrix that is formed when you cross out the ith and jth column of A. Very similar to the M uh, matrix we were finding earlier, or the M determinant that we found earlier. The size is going to be N minus 1 times N minus 1 again. So the cofactor of A is going to be written as C11 through C through C sub N sub N, or sub N N. And the adjoint of A is going to be simply the uh, cofactor transposed. So I'm going to just take the, the cofactors and write each column as a row. And that will give me the uh, uh, I'll give me the adjoint of A. So another important point is that uh, because the C I J or the cofactors are very similar to the M uh, determinants we find or the M variable we looked at earlier. Um, I mean, in fact, they are the same thing. So you can use um, this formula to go ahead and find it. So the way this works is, you, if you look at A, A11, A12, dot, 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 A1N, and let me just briefly, let me just skip over everything here, so that would be what, A, uh, N1, so, and so on and so forth. So what you, how you would do this is you would sweep through J, so J would be your, so I, J, J would be your columns, so you would start with A11, and your determinant is going to be A11 times uh, Cij. Uh, so that's going to be uh, when you cross out these terms and you you, you find the remaining 
uh, numbers here. So really, what this is doing is uh, is combining Cij is the same as M, except that it combines a sine as well. So it's going to absorb the sine negative one to the one plus n, and uh, uh, in other words, it's very similar to M, except that it just absorbs the sine also. So um, let's see. Let's go ahead and talk about. Uh, let's go ahead and show you some examples. All right. So let's go ahead and solve some examples using using the inverse matrix method. So that is what the uh, question is asking us: is to solve these linear equations using the inverse matrix method. Now, so let's go ahead and rewrite a prop or sub problem A and begin uh, solving it. Okay, so I've gone ahead and uh, put this equation, these sets of equations in the uh, augmented matrix form. And what I'm going to do here is now uh, I'm going to uh, remind myself that, okay, uh, the inverse matrix method uh, finds X by uh, finding the inverse of A and multiplying it by B, which is my resultant vector. And I also remember, recall that uh, in the inverse of A is the transpose of the cofactor of A over the, de the determinant of A. So let's go ahead and uh, determine what the cofactor of A is first. So what I'm going to do is say, uh, let me find the cofactor of A. Then I'm going to transpose it. Transpose it. Then I'm going to find the determinant of A. And then divide. Uh, divide. These are my steps. So first, let's go ahead and find the cofactor of A. The cofactor of A, if you recall, is the, uh, for any given entry, it is when I cross out, so let's just write down A first. So don't confuse the augmented matrix with A itself. It's just the solution, the resultants are written in, uh, in an augmented form, which is why it's called that. So I'm just going to recall that A is the coefficient matrix shown here. And that is 5, 2, negative 3, and 3. And what I'm going to do is first for the C11, so I'm going to recall that. Uh, let me do all of this in blue to stay consistent. I'm going to recall that the, co the cofactor matrix is composed of some elements. And now I'm going to find C11 through C22. Okay, so let's recall that uh, C11 is going to be the first entry of the matrix A. Uh, or sorry, it, it is when we uh, look at the first entry of the matrix A and we cross out its column and row. So we have a 3 here, that's what remains when we cross these out. But then we remember that I and J are the indices, uh, are the signs. So we're going to have a negative um, 1 to the I plus J. I plus J times 3 and I plus J I and J are um, 1 and 1 there so that's a 2 that's squared so we get a positive number 3 then we have the C12 C21 and C22 and those are oops, for C12 C12 we cross out what's here and what's here we get a negative 3 but 1 and 2 are going to give us an odd number as j, as i and j. So 1 and 2 there are going to give me 3. So a negative 1 to the third is a minus. And we also have uh, uh, a negative 3 here. So that's a plus. Let's double check. So 1, 2. That's a 1. That's a 2. That's a minus 3. That's a minus. So that's a plus. Then there's c21. So it's c21 is at the minus 3. I'm going to cross this out and cross this out. I have a 2. So 2 and 1 are going to again give me a negative. And I have a 2 there. So that's a minus 2. Then I have a C22, uh, that's going to give me an even number, that's a positive number then. So when I look at 3, that's going to cross that and that out, that's a plus 5. And I'm going to go ahead and say that the cofactor, so I found the cofactor of A, which is uh, 3, oops, 3, 3, minus 2 and 5. Then I'm going to find the adjoint, which is the transpose of this. So recall the transpose that I'm just going to write the first column as a row. 
so 3 and minus 2 and then the second column has a row so 3 and 5 so I went ahead and did those two steps the next one is to find the uh, determinant of a and then divide so the determinant of a which I can write this way is equal to uh, if you recall the formula it's going to be 5 times 3 minus 2 times minus 3 minus 3 so 5 times 3 minus 2 times minus 3 which is a 15 minus and minus are a plus plus 6 which is 21 we found that as well and now we just have to divide to find a inverse which is not the full solution yet so I'm gonna have a 1 over 21 which is the uh, 1 over the determinant times the adjoint which is 3 minus 2 3 5 uh, so what's what that's going to be is a uh, 3 minus 2 uh, that's over 21 let's just simplify it now 3 over 21 is 1 7 then I have a minus 2 over 21 3 over 21 is again 1 7 and a 5 over 21 so I found all of those then I have to recall that from this equation up top that I need to multiply the a inverse by b to get my final answer b was 3 and 15 it's a column vector so my answer is x hat or x vector uh, so it's going to be 1 over 7 negative 2 over 21 1 over 7 5 over 21 multiplied by 3 and 15 and so I'm going to have a 2 by 2 multiplied by 2 by 1. Inner dimensions match, so I can multiply. Then I'm going to end up with a 2 by 1, which is this and this guy. Uh, so I'm going to have a 1 7th times a 3, which is a 3 7th, plus a negative 2 over 21 times a 15. Then I have a 1 7th times a 3 again, plus a 5 over 21 times 15 and finally let me go ahead and just calculate these so if you go ahead and uh, put this into the calculator or do it by hand you're gonna get negative 1 and 4 as expected which means that x1 is minus 1 and x2 is minus or, or 4 and that is the final answer there okay now let's go ahead and look at the 3 by 3 example now so again we have to find um, let's see. We have to find x vector, remembering that it is a inverse multiplied by b vector. So let's go ahead and find a inverse, which, if you recall, it is the we have to first find the cofactor of a, then find the adjoint of a, which is cofactor of a transposed, then we have to find the determinant of a. And lastly, we have to just divide the adjoint by the determinant to find the, uh, that's only to find uh, A inverse. And finally, we have to multiply A inverse by B. So these are our steps. We have to remember, because there's so many procedures, we have to not get lost in them. Especially now that we have a 3x3, three three, which is uh, many sub-procedures. Uh, so let's go ahead and find cofactor of a so uh, the cofactor of a is going to be composed of uh, c11 c12 c13 so these are the cofactors and let me go ahead and list them here okay they have been listed and now let's go ahead and uh, look at the vector matrix a so for c11 we're going to look at this guy cross out these two and we're going to have a two by two determinant the sign is going to be a, a i and j are a one and one so that's a positive so i'm going to have a positive sign there and have a 10 minus 4 minus 4 9 for c12 one, 2, one, two there's a so it's one two so um the sign is going to be a negative and I'm going to have negative 5, negative 4, negative 5, 9. 
The sign is a negative, negative five, negative four. Let's see, was that correct? Negative nine, negative five, negative four, negative five, nine. Um, now we're going to go to the third one, and that's going to give us a uh, one, three, which is a positive number. One and three added are four. Negative one to the fourth is positive. So we're going to have a negative five, ten, negative five, negative four. Takes care of that. Negative five, negative four. And let's go to the next set. So two, one. That's again, let's just real quickly determine the signs. 2, 1 is 3, which is a negative sign. 2, 2 is a 4, that's a negative 1 to the 4th, that's positive. 2, 3 is going to be odd numbers, so that's negative. 3, 1 is positive. 3, 2 is odd, is negative. And 3, 3 is positive. Now let's go ahead and uh, find the rest. So, uh, let's see. C, 2, 1. Is going to be a uh, if I cross out this and this that's 10 negative 4 negative 4 9 10 negative 4 negative 4 negative 4 9 then I'm going to look at 2 2 which is going to be this guy negative 5 negative 4 negative 5 9 5 9 uh, 2 3 is going to be if I cross these out I get negative 5, 10, or sorry, uh, let's see, did I make a mistake on the rest? I believe I made a mistake on this set. Okay, so let's look again at 2, 1. So 2, 1, I'm going to cross out, so that's 2, 1, I'm going to cross out this and this. So I'm going to have negative 5, negative 20, negative 4, 9. So it helps to actually cross them out and look at them. Let's get these going too. Now let's look at uh, 2, 2. So this is 2, 2. Cross that out, cross that out. That's 25, negative 20, negative 5, 9. negative 20. Negative five nine. Then let's look at uh, two three. So it's going to be this guy and this guy. So it's going to be twenty five negative five negative five negative four. Now let's move on to the third row. So three one is going to be uh, this guy and this guy. So negative five negative twenty ten negative four. And let's go to the second guy here. So that's that and that. So 25, negative 20, negative 5, negative 4. Then finally, let's look at 3, 3. It's this guy, this guy. So negative, so 25, negative 5, negative 5, 10. All right, now I'm going to quickly just calculate the um, determinants are the 2 by 2 since you already know how to do that. Okay, so I went ahead and filled these out since they're just 2 by 2 determinants. I encourage you to go ahead and try this in case I made a mistake and you go ahead and uh, calculate it. Uh, now, I went ahead and I also put this into the appropriate positions into the cofactor of A, uh, the matrix that represents the cofactor of A. Now we simply have to uh, find the, deter the transpose, which is the adjoint of A. Adjoint of A, and remember, recall that uh, the way we found the transpose was to simply take the column and make it a row, and vice versa. So the first column is going to be the first row. So 74 minus 35, 220. The second column is going to be the second row. 200. The third column is going to be the third row. Really hope these numbers were calculated correctly because otherwise it's going to take a long time to redo. Now we found the adjoint, and now um, what we do is find the determinant of A. And let's do it this way. 
So recall that you only have to calculate the uh, uh, the cofactor matrix once, and then you can also find the determinant that way. So I'm going to use this formula that we talked about earlier to find uh, the determinants instead of having to redo the entire thing. So the cofactor, so all we need to do is find uh, A, let's see, the, car, the row is going to be 1, so I is going to be 1, A1, um, 1, C11, plus A12, C12, plus A13, C13. Uh, so let's go ahead and find that. So A1 is going to be 25, negative 5, and negative 20. Let's write those down. 25, negative 5, negative 20. These are all added. These are all added. And now let's find the coefficients, the cofactors. So C11, let's double check that really quickly. 25, negative 5, and negative 20. And I forgot about this one. So let's go ahead and find the cofactors. We have a uh, 74, 65, 70. 74, 65, 70. And that is going to give us, so this is going to give us a 125. And uh, that number is, of course, familiar. Now let's go ahead and find A inverse, which is 1 over the determinant multiplied by the uh, uh, adjoint, which is the transpose of the cofactor. So let's go ahead and write that here. Edit, copy, edit, paste. Let's go ahead and copy that here. I'm going to go ahead and just write the final result uh, here. Okay, we have found A inverse. So this is A inverse. And now all we have to do is to find x, we have to multiply the a inverse by b, the vector, the resultant vector. So let's go ahead and look at what it was, and it was 50, 0, 0. So we simply have to multiply what we have here, which I'll have to copy again because it's a bit long. Edit, copy, edit, paste. Let's take that away and let's multiply by 50, 0, 0, 50, 0, 0, which in a way simplifies things because we only have 50 times the first column vector and that is going to be our final result. I'm going to go ahead and calculate that. Okay, so we went ahead and found the final solution and as you can see, these are the exact same numbers for the 3x3 three three example that we did earlier using different methods. So we can see that various methods agree, and we're finding the same solution. I hope that you found this video useful. The, the uh, summary is that uh, we used linear algebra, we used some basic linear algebra skills like uh, multiplication, matrix multiplication of 2x2 two two and 3x3 three three matrices, determinants, cofactors, and uh, various methods such as Gaussian elimination, uh, Kramer's rule, and as well as... Uh, uh, matrix inversion to be able to find the vector that we're looking for which is the uh, variable the solution to uh, systems of linear equations let's go ahead and summarize these results and uh, call it a day okay in summary we have found a solution to these sets of linear equations uh, via the inverse matrix method and uh, in summary um, I would just conclude that um, I would really encourage you to go ahead and solve some more problems like this because we'll be using this these methods throughout the lecture series uh, and uh, it's just very helpful uh, regardless of what field of science and engineering you go into uh, linear algebra is extremely helpful and uh, it is just used in so many different places that it's very useful if you know these skills uh, because we've done a lot of examples and uh, I've gone over an hour I'll go ahead and conclude this lecture without a quiz I just recommend that you just do more problems and uh, get ready for the next lecture. Uh, thank you for staying with me. I'll see you in the next lecture.